writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is David Allen Lucas. Supposedly, I'm an author of mystery, science fiction, horror, and poetry, but for the last week of writing, I'm starting to question even if that's true, Aww. even though I am published. And with me today is... Melanie Colaney. I write science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction, and unless I'm forgetting something, the only thing I have published is nonfiction, so... Mm -hmm. yeah. My name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a fantasy author and illustrator. I have a self-published picture book that should be hitting Amazon within the next week or so, so take a look for Dog Park. You can search me and you'll find me. I'm Matthew McGraw. I ain't got nothing published. Uh, I'm an amateur short story writer, and I'm working on a picture book called Patrick the Spider with Jennifer. And not the one that's going to be published next week, no. I take it. No, no. the one that should no. be out is called Dog Park, and it's based on an award-winning short film that I did back in college. It's a very different kind of small animal. <laughs> Much that's different, in, yes. That's yeah. in that. Patrick the Spider. <laughs> and by the time this airs, it actually is available for purchase now. Actually. Yeah. yeah, it should be. In and the future. Just, mm -hmm. just to promote Jennifer there a little bit, she's also got lots of books that are illustrated out there that she's done illustration of. Yes. <clears throat> but this is a book you this wrote. This is me, published. all me, writing. All Jennifer. All me and my best friend, Amazon's Create Space. <laughs> well, good luck. Thank Yay. you. Okay. Right. Today we're going to talk about elements of story. Most authors, or most writers, when we start off writing, we go to high school classes, college classes, and hope we learn what we're supposed to learn there. Some of us will turn to magazines and books and how-to books of how to write, and I could probably paper the inside of STL book STL books with that and make it their wallpaper is literally the covers of all these how-to books hmm. on how to write. Now, the reason why there's so many is there's no one agrees necessarily 100% on what works, what doesn't work. That's because this is an art. <laughs> we learn as we go what works for us and what we keep in our toolbox or paintbrushes or whatever and what we don't. So I'm going to ask the right back today real fast. Let's start off with what we see. What do we see as an important element in any story, be it fiction or nonfiction, books, short stories, movies, television, radio plays, etc., in all the media's of storytelling. Um, I think I'm going to channel what I think Brad would say if he was here, mm -hmm. and that would be character. Yeah. But what about character? Uh. Basically, people are reading, or what they want is the character. They want people, or the, whatever the story is about. Actually, your character doesn't have to be a person, technically. But, it um, helps. <laughs> yes, it helps. But uh, they want the person to be someone that they care about. What, care about what happens to this person. The... Uh, writing character, I agree, is the most important part of an engaging story. For any other reason than we, as humans, as readers, we need someone to identify with to draw us in. You can go to a hundred million different worlds as long as you have someone you recognize that you want to follow around, that you care for, that it matters whether or not they win or they live or die. That's what makes you keep reading. It's oh, not because the world is fantastic, although the world can be fantastic. But fantastic worlds will get boring if you don't care about anyone in them. And you can actually hate the character. You can read to see, make see if the bad character, something bad happens to the character. That's a completely legitimate way to go. True. Oh, and speaking of that, though, um, while technically, yeah, it's true that I guess a story would get boring without a character. I really like setting. I like my worlds and world building and the world to be interesting. Now, is setting just another character, though? I feel like it is. I feel like a setting A characters, yes, are important. I'm going to go back to that in a moment, but I think setting is a character in, its, in and of itself. And 
with that, it should reflect the story in general, but also act on its own in a way. Now, that might sound weird to say, but it should be alive, just like all your other characters are alive. I remember a book I read for class as a senior in high school. It was called Utopia. It's Okay, it's not the Communist Manifesto, but I kind of think of it that way. It's, it's this ideal society. In Latin, utopia means no place. But there, in Utopia, the whole book was the setting. There was no plot. There were no characters. There were people in there, but there were no characters. It was all setting, would and you I count actually that enjoyed as, it. Would you count that as a story, though? Was there a story or was that just a book? Because books, you know, books can be about anything. It told you the story of the world. So I guess there was a story. It told you how this world worked. Well, uh, I think, hmm. aside even from characters, that uh, Utopia might be lacking something even more basic, I think, which is conflict. (laughs) Yes. Stories are about, well, this is something I did get from school. One of the most uh, common things you hear is that stories are about conflict. Drama is about conflict. Is conflict... And just an element of plot, though. Uh, it can be internal, though. Like, Here, it can be part yeah. of a character. Here's how I'm going to respond to that one, is plot itself should be this as well, but conflict should come organically from your characters and mm-hmm. your setting. Plot, the same thing. But with the characters, when I write, and what I attempt to do, and I don't... If I can't answer this question... I know I've got a problem. <laughs> and that is, who is fighting whom and for what? And to be honest with you, I stole that question from a book called The Anatomy of Story by John, and I'm probably going to mispronounce your last name because I have a bad habit of doing that, John Trub- Truby. Truby, Truby, T-R-U-B-Y. It's a book for screenwriters mostly, but it's used also in novels and so forth. But if your characters don't have conflict, how can they change? What's the purpose of the story if they can't change, if they don't change? Even if the character is just pure setting, in like Utopia. So, okay, so wait a minute. Is another element of the story, then, that your characters have to change? There should be, I believe, at least a fractional change. Now, see, in episodic things, um, sorry, sometimes characters don't change. <laughs> sometimes they don't. But they have different arcs in episodic things. In episodic things, it's more of a um, problem, solve a problem. So yeah. the arc would be the solving of the problem. Right, but and in that's that where case, the conflict comes from. Yeah, so there's a conflict resolution, but... And a character can change within one episode. True. I mean, they don't... As long as the change that they make is... Temporary? Not, yeah. Is not something that's going to force the episode out of syndication. It's... Yeah, a character can enter... With this backstory knowledge that, oh, um, I've always, you know, my family has always hated people from this neighborhood. That's how we go. And at the end of the episode, maybe he learns that not everyone from the neighborhood sucks. But when we come back to the next episode, and the next episode has people that he's grudging against that are from the neighborhood, he still has that bias against people from the neighborhood, but he's learned a little something in that one episode that, that he changed him. In the next episode. Yeah, well, that oh, changed okay. him enough to make the episode feel like it had an arc, but not so much that it made him completely different so that we don't feel, you know, it doesn't feel wrong. Well, and right, there's something you said right there. I'm going to just, I'm going to pounce on it. And then I'm going to use an example of what I think is a great one of showing a character changing but in historic history <clears throat> historically speaking both on television and in various books you've got episodic episodes <laughs> and you've got episodic episodes that have an arc yeah and in the case let me use old-fashioned star trek first see first the original series enterprise i'm oh, not enterprise um never star enterprise. trek star trek next generation i liked enterprise just it has potential. It, it had its potential, and it wasn't fully tapped into. Trek fights the Bruin. Yes, Trek fights the Bruin. Anyway, um, Next Gen had this as well, which is the, in generally speaking, the entire cast reset. All the characters reset at the end of the episode, and that episode didn't carry weight into the next ones. 
A lot of that was caused by the fact that episodes weren't shown necessarily in order of them being filmed. They were randomized, if you will, by the network. We've we've changed. Our TV viewing has changed since then. Book-wise, a lot of your episodic series... Like Sherlock Holmes, the Sherlock, original. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, Spencer for Hire. It was where I was going to go, but Sherlock Holmes works as well. The characters don't change that much because the storyline's not necessarily carried from book to book to book to book. Now, there are other ones that do. One of my favorite mystery TV shows, and it's done by BBC, is Luther. Luther is a basically a, a detective, and he investigates the darkest crimes. And this, he's always has a little bit of a dark side, but as the story continues through the three series, it chips away at him, it breaks at him, and you see that deconstruction of a character occurring. Another one, the God, the both books and movies, Godfather, which is basically a fairy tale story of a third of the third born being coming the king. That's what Godfather is. But it's a deconstruction hmm. of a character instead of a construction where you're building up the character to overcome something. This is a deconstruction where he's falling. And it goes through the, that goes through the movies. And if I remember right, um, at least two books of this deconstruction. Uh, well, I was just thinking, in defense of, like, Sherlock Holmes and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. well, like, we'll go, you know, Sherlock Holmes, he's about as deep as a pancake. <laughs> but uh, I would argue that like the characters you learn about in those stories aren't him. Mm-hmm. You're not coming for Sherlock they're... Holmes necessarily. You're not coming for Watson. Oh, I disagree. They're definitely coming from Sherlock Holmes. But <laughs> there are other characters to learn yes. about, and those two are vehicles that take you to them, and you learn about them through them. Yes. Yeah. Which I think is a lot of detective stories. Agreed, most certainly. You want to find the mystery and solve all the mystery using all the clues and suspects that you encounter. It requires a lot of rapid learning when you go through a mystery story. Yep, it does. mystery plot is very important to mysteries in general. Plot's less important for some of the other genres. I don't know if I'd agree with that. I mean, yes, yes, mystery plot, very important for mystery. I do 1,000% agree there. But I'm not sure I disagree. I'm not sure I agree about okay. plot not being as important for the other genres. Okay, here's the thing. Okay, here's the polar opposite type idea. Okay. Romance. There is a plot in romance. Yes. But when you start the romance and you read chapter one, nine times out of ten, an experienced romance reader knows what will happen in the entire book after reading chapter one. The plot isn't really all that important. Well, yes. In romance, though, the plot usually is involves love at first sight. Or to borrow from author Julian May, who did not write romance, she wrote science fiction. But she said, there's no such thing as love at first sight, it's only sex at first sight. So. Well, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, are plot and story interchangeable, or are there aspects hmm. unique to each concept? I, I, would, I would say that story is broader than plot, because story yeah. includes character and setting, and plot is just plot. So plot you would just... define plot as the sequence of events that happen. Right, like the outline of the story, and then I'd define story as including the characters and the um, the characters, the setting, and the plot. So everything together, I'd say this is the story. story. I could agree with that. I'm thinking, yeah, I, I'm kind of sitting on the fence. I agree with it, but another way I'm looking at it too is you've got your main plot and you've got any subplots. No. Each of those are plots. <laughs> it's the wrapping up and interweaving of those plot lines that creates story. So in a way, it's your plot is your thread and your story is your tapestry that you're finishing finished up with. Can you write a story without a plot? Well, apparently you can. Um, <laughs> most, apparently. Of the, mo- most of the books I ended up having to read in school, be it middle school and high school especially... Yeah, clearly it's it, it does exist. <laughs> um, there's yeah, reasons, I don't there's reasons why that yeah. 
Um, certain books that I had was forced to read back then. After reading two paragraphs, I was asleep because there was no plot. Um, so, yeah, I I don't remember them. Again, for me, I remember plot. So yeah. mm-hmm. the books that I don't remember all that well, I don't remember much about them. I remember the fact that I've read books with either virtually no plot or no plot at all. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember what their titles are or what their authors are. They might have had good characters. They might not have. I just don't remember because that's what I latch on to. I latch on to the plot. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a whole, in fact, it still exists, a whole genre in which plot is not that important. And it's stream of consciousness. Oh, okay. Of writing. Well, and also but, the whole style of realism. Um, realism is like the day in the life. Mm-hmm. So you pick a day in a life, then you pick a day in a life later, whatever, and things happen. But some of those have more plot than others. Let's just put it that way. So some realism books have plot, but some not a whole lot. So are you confident saying that a book that is a day in the life is a story? Or is it more of a treatment? Oh, you can do a you can do a day in the life story. Not all day in the life whatevers are stories, but you can do a day in the well, life. I'm trying. Story. I'm still trying to figure out if a story can have no plot. Yeah. I think a story can have no plot, at least according to convention. I don't <laughs> think it can have no. Plot. Okay, very I think little it can have plot. Very light. <laughs> like I'm thinking of uh, the the example I'm thinking of is uh, the road. I think it's Cormac McCarthy. Mm, I don't okay. know. I didn't very read light. that one. Very light on plot, but it's a. It's not that important, and it's like it's part of almost how the uh, setting and the story goes. Is that there isn't a lot happening in the world, and it's very just kind of gray and dull. Yeah, speaking and, of that, yeah. Ursula Le Guin, her stories do have plot, but I kept reading. It's like, wait a minute, it's fifty pages, a hundred pages, one hundred fifty pages. Nothing's happened. And then I go back through, yes, there are things that happen, but it's like, yeah, two people are walking across the wasteland, and it's it's an ex- exploration of character, and there is, again, very minimal plot. Well, uh, that was The Left Hand of Darkness. Hey, I, I did remember that one. <laughs> oh, I got a, I got a good one. How about uh, Waiting for Godot? I'm not sure if it's anything more. It's just a play, I think. Yeah, it's yeah, a play. play is how I know it. Isn't it's it a one-act play? Uh, I think so. And it's basically just two guys are sitting on the side of the road. They're waiting for some guy. I thought they were sitting up. on the bench, but yeah, everything great's going to happen when Godot shows up and he never shows up. And then like some people come by and they stay for a while and then they leave. And there's no, there's no like plot really, which, uh, I think it was like kind of an experiment at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, that's an example of something that could have almost no, I guess no plot at all really. Yeah. But it has a story because there's character. There's the character characters. provide the story for that. And the story... Well, the story is almost kind of the lack of story. Because it's like an existentialist thing. Uh-huh. And it's, it's sort of saying, like, you know, there is no greater meaning or purpose to the universe. There's no greater meaning or purpose to this play. Uh-huh. And it sort of encapsulates that idea in itself. I don't remember if it's E.E. E. Cummings or someone else that I can't remember at all. But he had a very interesting way of doing dialogue. And a whole lot of his stories had pretty much very little plot. And it might not be E.E. E. Cummings, so don't don't <laughs> trust me. It might be something completely different that I read the same year. Um, so which is more important, plot or character? Apparently, in modern publishing, it is character. Well, I the, actually like plot, though. <laughs> don't worry about modern publishing. The whole point of this roundtable discussion mm-hmm. yeah. is talking about personal angles. Because right. we can yeah. go anywhere and read a book about what's more important, character or plot. Exactly. But we're, mm-hmm. we're comparing our specific feelings. When you're reading a book, you've already talked, Mel, about how when you're reading a book and the book has no discernible plot, it becomes forgettable. Mm-hmm. Whereas I've read plenty of books that have no plot, but I need to have a character that I love in order for them to yeah. be interesting. And sometimes this the situation is interesting. Perfect example, one of my favorite books in the entire world is House of Leaves. I couldn't name you a single character out of that book. But the the conflict was interesting enough. The idea of a modern labyrinth and a house that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. A TARDIS! No, sorry. That was, this was a pretty dark TARDIS. Mm. But the I wanted to find out what was up with this house, what was wrong with it. There was something very wrong with it. And there was one character that's worth noting, and it's the author himself. He puts himself in the book, and I remember him because he was the character story, and it was about how writing this book, he would, he found the notes 
for the book from supposedly firsthand experience. This guy experienced this house that was bigger on the inside than it was on the outside. And as he was going through these notes and compiling the book, the the book started affecting his life. Like the Minotaur that lived in the in the labyrinth was appearing in different forms in his actual life that he chronicled in the footnotes at the bottom. Wow. And it was, it's a pretty, it's a heady book. I love it desperately. It's one of those that, and it, by the end of it, it's trying to affect your life while you're reading it. Wait, I was, I was actually just thinking about a, a book that I do like, that it has a plot, but now that I think about it, the plot is almost incidental. It mm-hmm. has a plot, it has a decent plot, but it's character and setting that's important. Mm-hmm. It's the Thursday Next series. And Thursday is a very memorable character she lives in an alternate version of Reading, England, as in an alternate world, where uh, the ducks are extinct and dodos are a very common pet, um, among other things. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, actually, there is a real plot, but the whole point of the plot is just to give her an excuse to go to interesting places. Mm-hmm. Well, let me let me turn this question on its head. What kind of stories do you like to read, and what throws you out of a story? I'll start off with that. <clears throat> I like I like action oriented stories, mm-hmm. which of course are more plot stories. I'll be honest. It doesn't matter if it's science fiction, fantasy, detective stories, or what. What will throw me out is when the characters are characters start doing something that's unbelievable to the character creation at, at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, two examples. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to mention names. They're well-published authors, and I'm not going to throw them underneath the bus. One is a story, you, if any of the audiences have read these books, you'll probably recognize it, even though I'm trying not to throw these authors on the bus. One book took about 900 pages to get into. Hmm. I'll be honest. You read 900 pages? pages? just to really get into the book. Very yeah. patient. I was. Well, I was determined. I was told that this it does reward that really but, limits the books considering <laughs> yeah but i was also told not to read the epilogue and i screwed up and read the epilogue yeah well when they tell you not to well, curiosity will yeah. just take you down the story is a man a woman they married <laughs> and this call it a demon like bear thing not to give anything away he gets born out of the woman by the way <clears throat> and the man is basically a pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps self-made man. The woman's a real tough woman. He ends up fighting this demon physically, hand-to-hand. And at the end of the final chapter, he's drowning in a pool. Okay, it, it's like, how can I not read the epilogue? Because, uh-huh. you know, you want to know, hey, does he live? What happened to the wife? Etc. Yeah. Well... The end of the epilogue, we learned that the demon took away the wife. And I'm, by the way, yes, if anybody's yelling at me that does know the story and hears me calling him a demon and going, no, he's not a demon, yes, I'm aware of that. I'm just trying to describe it best I can without giving anything away. <clears throat> anyway, he picks up, it turns out in the pool he had a heart attack. And they're, they're now, he, along with his nephews or nieces or whatever they were relation wise, was on his wife's side are watching the Mardi Gras parade in, parade in New Orleans, where the, most of the story took place. And I forget if he's holding the char- character's hand or if he's has her up on the shoulder or something. But anyway, they're watching. The kid says something, and he says, in a mamby-pamby voice, I hope my wife comes back to me. Hmm. What? Yeah. <laughs> I literally took that book, slammed it closed, and went to do a fastball straight into the trash can. It, until I realized, oops, this is not my personal book. So that was one. One has, A second one I'm currently reading, attempting to read now. Um, in fact, they've made a movie out of one of his books. This is, a, this is a book earlier in that series. I'm just having lots of difficulty getting through it to the point where I don't care. I think I know which book you're talking about. Um, and that book is... Um, I think what really threw me off is... Once again, a little bit out of character. And it's not so much out of character for these characters, it's out of character, I think, for humanity. <laughs> um, they take a... This guy has been crucified. Oh, literally. No, different one. Literally crucified. And they take him down and bury him. They're 
these two characters are have been captured by a right a right supremacy group, like a bear with scorn. And they've been told, okay, go take care of this, clean up this mess. If you don't come back, we're going to hunt you down. Okay. They really have no place to go. It's the, Their setting is their prison. So they take the guy down. He, two, male and female, he buries the dead guy. It's a gruesome scene, basically. And yet somehow, because they just looked at this ugliness of death, the two of them decide to strip naked and make love. <laughs> what? Yeah. In regards to the fact they have already done that at least once in the Graveyards have been a common location for such things for all time. <laughs> Where do feel more yes. alive than in the face of death? <laughs> this is true, and that's probably the counterdic- that's probably the contradiction. But with all the deaths I've seen, it be- graveyards different story. They're buried. Yeah. It, it's, it's, the point it's that. is that <laughs> you just you just cleaned up a murder scene really it's not like, not really set in the mood not set in the mood no, no, there's, <laughs> no, there's no light candles no dinner there you know doesn't yeah. sopping up blood make you horny oh man uh, yeah, right. I, I will say for me there are two things that will pull me out and they pull me out in different ways but i'll just say the more obvious one first and that is again when something goes along that doesn't make sense and that could be a detail so um what I thought Dave was talking about, but he's not talking about that. At least I don't think so. But uh, I was reading uh, the first or second Jack Reacher novel. And there are a couple of things of that that... Uh, oh, okay, I didn't read that one. Um, it, no, that, that's it. It's, it was the second book. Ah, <laughs> okay. But uh, Jack Re- Reacher, there was a couple things that bugged me. One, the author is clearly not an American. And the reason why I know he's not an American, because he call, he talked about ethnic tension in the American South. Ethnic mm. tension? Yes, ethnic. instead of racial tension. Ah. See, he was talking English, not American. <laughs> and that well, pulled me the, out. That's the job of the localization. They needed yeah. to have a yes. little bit of a localization going on. Just like reading all these skullduggery books that I'm doing, the when... I know when I've crossed over from the ones that were published in America to the ones that were published in England, because they just call things different. You know, your your yard is now your garden. You know, it's the boot of the car. But the thing is, I have no problem. If the book is set in England, I have no trouble with them speaking British English. But if the book is set in an American South, and and the person, this character, is an American... And we're supposed to be in the character's head. The American, the character needs to think in the language that we're talking about. Just FYI, for those, as she says, the second book of the Reacher series, it's not set in the South. I understand. What no, but the getting. first one is. The first one. Is. Yeah. The second one is set actually up in California North- or something. No, yeah. up basically Montana, oh. that territory close to the border of Canada. Okay, and then there's there there was something else about the first Jack Reacher books. There were just too many amazing coincidences in that book. Without giving anything away, he just happened to show up in town at the same time there was a big murder. And then the um, he just without uh, okay spoiler alert. But this throws you out of the story, or yeah, it throws me out of the story when it just happens again and again and again. So it threw you out of the series. Not so much out of the story. It threw you out of the series. No, the first time. He walked into town, and he was arrested for a murder that just right. happened. That was fine. That was an amazing coincidence, but you get one of those. But mm. then there was another amazing coincidence. That it turned out the murder victim was his brother. Wow. Oh. Yeah, which, um, once again, they didn't do quite too some certain research, too. Yeah. On that, and I don't want to get into and that. And there was but... another one that I don't remember, but the point is... Oh, and then the other thing is no one was talking like they would really talk in the, for the setting. I'm thrown out of stories mostly by tone shifts. Mm-hmm. I don't like tone shifts. A great example, not to spoil anybody, uh, currently on the shelves, and I recommend reading because it was interesting, uh, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. It's a good book. Sold really well last year for YA. Um, it was setting this really cool sort of mystery plot about supernatural time travel stuff, and there was this cute little romance going on. And right there at the very end, it became an action movie. 
Mm-hmm. And I honestly, when I realized what we were doing, flipped until it was over because I did not care. I didn't care about who kicked who in the face. I didn't care about who fell over what chair. I didn't care about this or that. I cared about whether or not the girlfriend, the boyfriend ended up surviving and if we got to go back to our normal time or if we were stuck in the past or the future. And I wanted to know about plot relevant, tone relevant stuff. I didn't care about the fist fight because none of these people were bare knuckle boxers. <laughs> and you know, another story if you were reading about a ninja and the ninja got into a fist fight, well then you're like, "Oh, sweet, ninja's going to get into a fist fight." You knew that was coming. Swell, let's do it. So if it violates so you your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in general, you get thrown out if the story violates your expectations in Certain ways that don't make sense to you. I mean, well, that's different than a surprise. It's when it feels twist. wrong. Yeah. When it doesn't. It's when I lose confidence in the author. When I feel like it's a mistake of the author and not the yeah. story doing something. Like anytime the author, I begin to see um, the fingers of the of the author and the story or the scripts. When you start to see the script through a TV show or a movie uh-huh. and you see the breaks and you see when the lines begin and end and you see when one guy's line ends with an M dash and the other guy's supposed to cut him off but he waits just a half second <laughs> too long. It's uh, it's when it, you're, you're taken out of the story when suddenly you realize that you're looking at a piece of written media. Right. It's you when see you, the it's strings. When you, feel awful you see the form, strings yeah. of the marionette and it ruins it. You, you can feel, you can see the formula. But exactly. And you know, um, we, we talk about when things throw us out and what things we can forgive. Mm-hmm. If that story I've been reading has an awesome character that I'm interested in, I'll read past that point and I'll keep going. Um, in the case, like Miss Peregrine's Home for Children, for Peculiar Children, I wanted to find out what happened to the children and to Miss Peregrine and to our lead character. I wanted to find out what happened to them. So instead of just saying, I'm bored and leaving the book aside, I uh, I kept going. I flipped past that part because I was bored, but I kept going. Other situations, if I'm reading a mystery story and it stops real quick to have an intimate sex scene for no other reason than they're supposed to have one at this point in the book, yeah. I just skip right past that because it's a tone shift. I don't care. I'm, I'm not convinced that it's going to have anything to do with the rest of the book. And if it does, I'm sure they'll reference back to it in context clues and I'll figure it out by myself. I don't want to waste my time reading something that feels weird and forced. Uh, okay. I guess I'll do uh, my segment now. Okay. <laughs> and now, this we is all, now Matt's let's segment. Click, let's just, click, strapped in, here we go. Let's Matt's going non- on the floor. Let's just non-sequitur right in here. <laughs> uh, Throw your hands up. Okay. I actually, I like to think that I'm fairly, I'm not that difficult to impress. Like, <laughs> I'm very difficult to impress. I'm aware of this. I've come to terms with it. I've prayed about it. <laughs> Or at least not difficult to, like, get hooked. All I need is, like, one interesting idea of some kind. Something new with some little bit of spin to it. it whether it's, like, an idea for a character that's a little different than normal, that has something weird going on, or if it's, like, some part of the world that is an interesting idea to it, or some part of the story that's got, like, a neat twist. Mm-hmm. It's all I need. It's just one neat idea. And if it, what kills me is when it doesn't have that. <laughs> it was when there's just like, it's kind of by the numbers, you know, like somebody writes like a mystery novel and it's mystery that's already existed in some form. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, well, I like mysteries. Well, I, I think I've read a mystery before. Uh-huh. I just, yeah. <laughs> no interest. It's all I need is one neat thing. Mm-hmm. You need that twist? I need a twist, or I need, like, a complex character of some kind that's weird. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm kind of soft for characters, I'll admit. It's like a... If it's a person that feels real and you can care about them and you can see their life going, like, an interesting way... You know, because I, I enjoy, like, experiencing the lives of people that are different from me. Mm-hmm. Sort of seeing through their eyes, understanding the world, how they see it. Even if I think like it's wrong or stupid how they see it, you know, I'm still interested <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. to see how they see it. So like, that's really all I need: different perspective, something different. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, go ahead. Well, just to summarize, it seems like the elements of the story are not necessarily in this order: character, setting, plot, mm-hmm. 
Um, and, At least a sense of plot, anyway. Well, yeah. But those are the <coughs> plot or lack thereof. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I and, think one of the things that we're not, we haven't talked about, and I think it's really what separates out the good books from the great books is not only is there a premise to the plot, there's a designing, there's a, how do I want to put this, a <clears throat> driving design behind the plot. And if you, if anybody, if this would be a video instead of audio, which thank God this is not video, yeah, I'd break the camera. Me, you'd see me drawing all the time. Well, I, I just look at the camera and it's we'll just have it. That's we called gonna, brain, brain. Yeah, That's if we spiking, were going to have a webcam. Spike the camera when you look straight at the camera. <laughs> anyway, Melanie just raised her eyebrows like trying to figure out what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, the designing factor or the designing drive of a story is... Taking your premise of a story, which, if you go back to our talk about pitching, which was recorded last week, you take your pitch, basically, of a story, and you figure out how you're going to tell that story, and how, and in that how, does, is a de- the design of that story, and it's really a high concept to explain, I don't mean high as in, oh, it's upper level, I'm talking about it's high as in deep, deep aspect to it. But there's always something, a designing factor that keeps the entire story together that fixes your issues with tone, mm. Jen, what you're talking about. It is a... Okay, I'll use Godfather again. Godfather is... And the, print, the, the pitch, if you will, is a story of <coughs> the youngest son of a mafia family who tried to stay out, gets pulled in, and end up, ends up leading the family. The driving design is the fairy tale of a third born becoming the king. So that's the driving design versus the overall pitch. I don't know if I've explained that well or not. Hmm. Um, anyway. Yes, go ahead. I was going to throw a new question. Go on. I was going to do a new one, too. You want to, like, shoot rock, paper, rock, paper, scissors over? Rock, paper, scissors. One, two, three, go. Yeah, she cut. Snip, snip, snip. Um, We didn't uh, arrange that. It was legit. It was legit. (laughs) We have two witnesses. Uh, I was going to change it to uh, let's go go around and talk about when you were young, when you were young and untainted (laughs) by the world and oh. all of the lessons you've been taught in school and places, what were some of the stories you loved to hear over and over again as kids, and why did you love to hear them over and over again? I'll start. Uh, I loved the story of the Tinderbox, which is a Hans Christian Andersen story. Right. Thank you. Uh, it's one of his early ones. It's not the best plotted one of his stories. There is no a cautionary tale involved. It's just an adventure story about a rich, selfish man who murders for power. But the reason I loved it was because he tied a rope around his waist, he climbed down a hollow tree, and found a magic land with three giant dogs sitting on chests of treasure. That was awesome. And I wanted that story over and over again because my brain wanted to see him tying a rope around his waist, climbing down a hollow tree, and seeing a magic land. It's again with, you know, the reason why I love House of Leaves. I love this idea that there's a doorway to something that's big and and awesome. By the way, House of Leaves is R-rated, so just letting Mm -hmm. you know. (laughs) So don't let your young adult... Little kids don't read that book. (laughs) I'll let them learn about the world. Little kids can read The Tinderbox, which is about selfish man murdering for power. (laughs) That's a better moral lesson, probably. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Just, Just don't let your kids be like me, who ended up leaving all children's books behind by at third grade because I was bored with them. Hmm. Uh, this is according to my mother. The only sh- only story that uh, I would sit still and let my mom read, she had to tell me the other stories because I demanded attention, so I was real little at the time. But it was The Dog and His Bone, which was a, a golden book, which I don't really remember too well. You know, this was like, you know, two. Yeah. Uh, so, um, from... Vague memories of when I, you know, when my sister was being read it. Um, it was about a dog who sees basically his own reflection of another dog in the pond, in the pond, uh-huh. and he starts barking at the other dog, and he loses his bone in the pond. You know, so he a cautionary tale. Yes. yes. 
be happy with what you have. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, for me, I don't really remember that many of my children's books I read. As we've had, yeah, like, I've, I don't know if I sounded arrogant a moment ago. If I did, I don't mean didn't mean to. Hmm. But I really did. I started breaking away from the children's books in third grade. Well, what stories what, did you enjoy when you were younger and untainted by the evils of the world and lessons you've learned from school? Um, a couple of them. One was the story of vampires, like Dracula, mm-hmm. which I read fourth, fifth grade, maybe. Um, books of adventure. I started reading the Three Musketeers and all of Alexander Dumas's works. When I say Three Musketeers, it's really on top of the entire trilogy back in uh, third or fourth grade. Um, stuff like that. So it was the pure adventure, pure good guy, guy being good, even if he wasn't necessarily a good guy. What I mean is, life was black and white. Did you ever read Kidnapped? Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, Apparently that was based on a true story. Yes, it was. Robert Louis Stevenson, I love him. For more reasons than one on his writings, and which I'll explain it off off the, off the radio. Um, but to give you an idea of uh, another story, and this was, I say story. Remember, we're talking about all medias. When this story came out, it's a movie. It was the first of the movies that came out. VCRs were yes. I'm going to sound old. All you technological people out there who have been born after the iPad iPod came out, bear with me, VCRs did not exist at this time. We did have civilization prior to that. Um, this movie came out. It was only going to be in theaters. We never knew if it would ever show up in television. I was second grade age. I talked to my parents, my grandparents, and when they couldn't take me, I saved up the money that I was making off of cutting lawns and so forth. And and took the bus out myself to the movie theater to see this movie 22 times in the theater. Huh. And that movie was Star Wars. Uh-huh. Oh, oh. And oh, I, no. switched, no, oh. I just, I just well, banned what, straight over to Matt. Well, well, what about Star Wars made you come back 22 times? Well, once again, it was, it was the pure good versus evil. Mm-hmm. It was the adventure behind it. The buns on that lady. Mm. <laughs> I wasn't. Old, I wasn't old enough yet for that. That didn't come out to after VCR. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. rewind, fast forward, <laughs> rewind, rewind, fast, fast forward. forward. Be kind, rewind. Uh, <laughs> yes, Carrie Fisher was one of my first crushes as a kid. I'll get over that. <laughs> Moving on. Um, it was the action of the fights that were occurring, be it. At the time, the sword fight between Ben and um, Vader were not that great, but for its time period, oh, hey. Um, also, the X-Wings going up against the Death Star and fighting all the TIE fighters, and you're sitting on your edge of your seat. And I kind of laughed, too, because the voiceover as Death Star's getting ready to fire, it's going, stand by, stand by. And it just sounded like back then with the movie theaters, popcorn stand will be only open for one more hour. Mm-hmm. Popcorn stand will mm-hmm. be open for only one more hour. So it kind of gave a sense of hilarious, ir- ironic realism to it, even though really, clearly the story wasn't anything close to real. Mm-hmm. But And also to the sidebar is at the time, before this occurred, I was a fan, oh my god, a fan of Baba Black Sheep, always known as Black Sheep Squadron, which was a television show that was put on about the World War II squadron. It wasn't exactly accurate, but um, my parents would send me to bed when they changed the time. So I'd go to bed, my parents would be, him be t- watching it, and then I would sneak out of my bedroom and sit in the middle of the hallway where I could hear and see the television mm-hmm. in a distance to watch it. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Remember, this was the days before VCRs. You couldn't just record it and watch it at an earlier time. Exactly. Oh, uh, we'll see. Uh, the thing I read most as a kid was uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Every book of that I had, I read probably like 
thousand times over each, with no exaggeration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have you uh, read the new ones? New with ones? The, yeah, with uh, Calvin, Calvin grew up, and now it's Hobbes and uh, Calvin's daughter. I didn't think that was legit. Oh, no, it's, it's legit. It's by the same creator. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, me either. Uh, but yeah, when I was a kid, I read Calvin and Hobbes a lot, and, uh, I don't know. I guess, like, there's, there's characters to it, like, uh, the characters are all pretty static, it's like a comic, you know, it's a comic strip thing for, like, the newspapers originally, even though I read it entirely in book form, I never saw it in the, uh, post-dispatch or anything. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh... But yeah, there were like constant characters, never really changed, but you you got to know them, and they uh, were always reacting to new situations, and Calvin was always going on little adventures in his imagination, and that was a night nice, that was an interesting idea to me because you know that's those were the tools I had available too. It was just mm-hmm. my imagination mm-hmm. for having fun, and uh, yeah, I don't know, and it contained a lot of like. There was a lot of, like, kind of, like, highbrow stuff for a kid in those comics. You know, a lot of, like, weird ideas about, like, uh, advertising was one thing I remember. <laughs> like, uh, a lot of, like, corporate-related stuff. A lot of stuff about, like, the real world that was around me at that time. Mm-hmm. Which wasn't, like, you know, like a kid's book, you might turn it back to, like, you know, the 50s or something. Make it a little more, uh comprehensible this but this was like it was presenting the world that existed around me in a way that i could kind of understand even at the time mm-hmm. i don't know i think that was really it was really a great thing to be reading do you see any calvin and Hobbes present in your current writing and your style and what uh, you like to put into stories uh yeah i suppose so there's a there's a distinct sense of like undercutting to a lot of it mm-hmm. you know because even especially with the imagination bits like you know calvin would be like off in some fantastical world and then like his parents call and he has to come back Uh actually i'm thinking of one it was a sunday strip so it was a long one Uh but it's like calvin's he's like trying to go to this mystical world he gets called back by his parents he goes and does some chores or stuff Mm. he gets sent to his room Uh and he goes up and he looks out his window and it's just the window to his house but he sees this like mars landscape to it that nobody else sees he's just that's all he's got is that imagination Mm -hmm. but is it's all undercut by the reality so i don't know maybe Mm. I like undercutting things. Mm-hmm. It's what that uh, a story that I read. I think about the uh, the alien and the uh, cult leader woman. Yes, you probably weren't around for it. Okay, yeah, I missed that one. It was a good one. It's a uh, it's a a blase conversation between a witch and an elder core. Yeah, <laughs> it's one it of is, my favorites, actually, Matt. <laughs> and it's undercutting both those ideas. <laughs> oh, so this is something you've written. Yeah. Yeah, he he read it aloud to the writers guild. Ah, ah oh, an open mic night. I yep. Can't. Well, let me ask this question. I'm going to change subjects. Well, not change subjects, but I'm going to change directions. What have you learned through the experience through your own experiences as a writer and a reader that you've applied to your stories to avoid the problems that you've fallen into when you've read other stories? Being a writer has ruined all stories for me. <laughs> <laughs> They've all become a lesson to learn from, which is good and bad, because there are so many movies that, perfect example, and y'all can hate me if you want, uh, but... We hate you. I was watching, uh, I I went and saw the new X-Men movie in a theater. Uh Uh-huh. People love that movie, like, Rotten Tomatoes loves that movie. I thought it was mediocre at best. Because for every awesome X-Man thing that happened, there was a bajillion time travel plot holes. Yes. Yeah, the plot didn't make any sense and if you thought about it too much. I no. Time travel plots never. I couldn't they let, occasionally do, but yeah. I couldn't let that go. And as I was watching, I kept saying, why did he do that? Mm-hmm. Why He knows better than that. Why did they do that? Why did she do that? Why is she doing that now? How does that affect the present? Why isn't the present changing? What's going on here? Why do we keep... You know, going back to this, 
Why did the plot do that? That that just happened because plot reasons. We needed this person to get here, and that's why. I don't like that. That person never had that ability to before. Where did that superpower come from? So it's <laughs> a lot of, you know, I was unable to enjoy it at the same level that most of my peer group was able to enjoy it because I was looking at it from the angle of someone who was trying to edit it because I'm always trying to edit my own work. So when I'm reading my own work, I have to look at it from the angle of what are all the possibilities available to me in the specific thing. How can I solve this problem, quote-unquote, if it's even a problem that needs to be solved? How does this affect the rest of everything else? you gotta, you got to have a hands-on approach to story when you make it. You know, one plot, plot, one uh, blog that I like, and they haven't been posting that much recently, but it's called Law in the Multiverse. They go over legal issues, mostly in comic books, but also in movies and other things. Huh. But um, I've noticed a lot of the things, and they summarize it so you can cover it, you can understand what they're doing even if you haven't read the source material. But, you know, a lot of times what they go through is like, yeah, they could get this to work if they change this and the other thing. So a lot of these plot mistakes that are really ruining it, ruining it for Jennifer mm -hmm. could be fixed if they ju just took a little bit of time and did some editing before they went to production. That also pisses me off, is when you look at something and it would be so easy to solve it. Yes. Yeah. If they just done another draft, another yep. half a draft, if they worked an extra day on it with a friend, they could have solved this problem, but they didn't, and now it's ruined. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's one of the things uh, that I've gotten to, is that uh, you need to, you need things to develop naturally. You need to have your rules solid and set, and not deviate from them. And you have to try to like, you find a way to like, I don't know. There's no good way to describe this. Like punch pass. Like you get your base, and then you go further. Mm -hmm. Right. Like rather than uh, like plot convenience is kind of the other way. You have your base and you dip under it. Yeah. <laughs> You like you have to go. Well, I have to pull this down okay. because I need to make this happen. Here's a good example of something that really bugged me at the time. In Star Trek Voyager, Captain Janeway acted against character so often she didn't have a character. Now, acting against character should be a method of making your character deeper. So, for instance, if Spock is usually, I'm talking about the old school Spock here. He was logical, direct. Well, when he wasn't logical and direct, when he became emotional, that said something really important about Spock. You can do that. But you can do that, you know, maybe once, twice a season, and it has to be for something extraordinary, like going through the pond far or Kirk dying or, you know. And I'm not talking about the movie, by the way. I'm talking about when he, Spock showed some surprise when he thought he had killed, killed Kirk and it turned out Kirk was still alive. But, um, so, you know, that deepened our understanding of the character. But Janeway, it's like Janeway behaved in whatever way was worse for the ship. <laughs> Dependably. And that was just for the convenience of the plot. She wasn't consistent in her behavior. So that was, that was lazy writing. Yeah, that's just breaking your rules for your own convenience. Instead mm -hmm. of, like, pushing yourself a little harder to find, like, the way above that. The mm -hmm. way to go, like, to take that character and play it off the different another aspect of things and get both of them keyed up a little higher and push the conflict further. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier, much easier to say than do. Oh yeah, <laughs> much and especially if you're up against deadline like a lot of those writers are. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing is they have like they have, you know, the applesauce salesman <laughs> breathing down their neck like Yes, we've got to bring back that <laughs> that version. Oh, one one uh, book. This is actually a novel. It kind of deconstructs a lot of this stuff. I mean, it's a fictional book. It's kind of metafiction. It's called Red Shirts. Mm -hmm. And it's from the point of view of the red shirts in mm. like the in a Star Trek type universe. So it's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead? Kind of. <laughs> only they realize they're fictional characters. And they try Sounds and figure like out how, and they try and figure out how not to die. <laughs> oh. And it's they just go through the conventions and all that, and they have this exit. And the writer of the show has this existential crisis about killing his characters after he finds out that they actually get hurt when he hurts them, oh. you know. So, but it by making fun of it, it brings up a lot of these issues. So, what have you learned? Um. Well, 
I really like plot and I really like world building, so character, I suppose, I, uh, what I've incorporated is, like, I take other people's characters, at least in my head, I don't actually write fanfic much, but in my head, think, okay, here are these characters, what would they do in this actual situation, what would they actually do, you know, if presented with this, would they fight it, would they run away, you know, what would happen, it just helped me think out the whole story, and, uh, so you can't do a WWJB. No. What would what, Jesus what, do? Only no, is what would given fictional what, character WWJBD, do? yeah. Sorry. What would James Bond do? Uh, yeah. 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 Same concept. But the idea is if I'm taking someone else's character, there's this idea in my head, you know, what would Spock do? What would Kirk do in those situations? Versus what would Picard do? They would do different things, and that would lead the story in different places. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the things I've found very helpful is like treating it almost like acting when you're writing a character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you try to just get into character, try to be that person, yeah, see the world the way they now, do. Do you do that with the original drafts or do you do that more on your rewrites? Uh, I do that uh, from start to finish, yeah. I, like, I, don't, I don't know how I would even like start with their dialogue without doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to yeah. know. But, you know, I find because I try and get an idea of what the character is like, when the character starts talking, very often they say things that I didn't expect them to say. And it's like, wait a minute, it turned, they turned it in different people than I expected, so they behave different ways, and that's fine. But they just have to be consistent through the whole thing. So it's like I had two characters, and their personalities switched on me. So one turns out, oh, turns out she doesn't really know much. She's the, it, she's, uh, this is one of my own characters, and she's a, she's a ghost. But it turns out she doesn't know a lot about her family and background, and there's a whole lot about her own life she doesn't know. And she's the overprotective one. And the living character, it turns out she actually knows more and is more in control and confident than I was uh, originally writing her. So I always like that kind of thing, when something kind of surprises you about your own story, and then you just... But the, the point is, she, they have to stay consistent through the whole thing. Yeah, the trick is learning to roll with it instead yeah. of like fighting it. And, no, I had this plotted out. Get back, get back yeah. in the box. Yeah. Which is fine if you're writing for the first draft, but if it's all of a sudden you're in like draft five and uh, yeah, it's two weeks and like, okay, how are we going to do this? <laughs> sometimes it happens in draft five. Yeah. yeah. Characters are living creatures and sometimes they don't. They don't pay attention to when you have a deadline. They just suddenly tell you something exactly. last minute. And Which is, you got to decide if you want to honor them or not. <laughs> exactly. I, mean, I would say my own problem right now, this is what I've been dealing with for the last couple of years, actually, is writing myself into the dead end. It's like, okay, I know where this character, where this story was supposed to go, but organically it's not going there, and I'm now stuck over... Here, and there's no escape, and I can't find my way out of this maze. Yeah, that happened to me. Fortunately, it was near the beginning, and I just threw, I, I threw in a kidnapping attempt that actually made sense for this story, and then all of a sudden, everything opens up, and my outline is completely kaput, you know? But that's okay. <laughs> this is when I make charts, plus and minus. Mm -hmm. in, I got my start writing as a very young person. I can remember all the way back to... <coughs> First grade, first and second grade, uh, I started writing Choose Your Own Adventure Stories, uh -huh. which is actually a fantastic yeah. study, because not only do you have to consider every possibility, but then you have to see that possibility to its logical conclusion. I'd forgotten about those. Those are great. If anyone's having trouble, read some of those. They are wonderful, and I they were a great uh, set of training wheels to start with. If I, I ever taught a uh, creative writing class, I would have them at one point write a short Choose Your Own Adventure story. You know, start with three choices and make each choice branch twice and make each branch go to a certain length. You know, follow a couple to their logical conclusion. One will be the good ending, one will be the bad ending, but yeah, it goes everywhere. And all of these options are just as valid because it's all about where the reader wants to go. And you know what? I think on that note, we're going to have to end this because we are close to the end of the hour. Uh, thank you all for listening. Have a fantastic writing week. And come back next week for more in the writing industry on Right Back Radio. The Right Back would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore.
STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.